We're going to uh, two parts to the reading this morning. First part, uh, Daniel chapter 4, verses 1 to 18. So Daniel chapter 4, verses 1 to 18. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar has got another dream. And uh, Daniel again is going to share what it means. So let's uh, read together. It's on the screen or if you have your Bibles in front of you. Uh, let's read God's word. Daniel chapter 4 and beginning at verse 1. Uh, and this, uh, just to give us an understanding, this is uh, the first three verses is where Nebuchadnezzar is declaring what has happened. And then he goes into narrative in terms of uh, he goes back into what happened before, if you will. And uh, so that just gives us a bit of uh, understanding, hopefully. Nebuchadnezzar the king, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. How great are his signs, and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts on my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Therefore, I issued a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers came in, and I told them the dream, but they did not make known to me its interpretation. But at last, Daniel came before me. His name is Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God. In him is the spirit of the holy God, and I told the dream before him, saying, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy God is in you and no secret troubles you, explain to me the visions of my dream that I have seen and its interpretation. These were the visions of my head while on my bed. I was looking, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong. Its height reached to the heavens, and it could be seen to the ends of all the earth. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it. The birds of the heavens dwelt in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. I saw in the visions of my head, while on my bed, and there was a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven. He cried, cried aloud and said thus, Chop down the tree and cut off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts get out from under it and the birds from its branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump and roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze, in the tender grass of the field, let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let him graze with the beasts on the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from that of a man, let him be given the heart of a beast, and let seven times pass over him. The dec this decision is by the decree of the watchers, and the sentence by the word of the holy ones, in order that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, give it to who, give, uh, gives it to whomever he will, and sets over it the lowest of men. This dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now you, Belteshazzar, declare its interpretation, since all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known to me the interpretation, but you are able, for the Spirit of the Holy God is in you. Amen. Again, a cliffhanger. Verse so, 19 through to the end of the chapter. So Daniel chapter 4, beginning at verse 19. This is now where Daniel is going to interpret uh, the vision, the dream that Neb Nebuchadnezzar has been given. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, 
was astonished for a time, and his thoughts troubled him. So the king spoke and said, Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its interpretation trouble you. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, may the dream concern those who hate you, and its interpretation concern your enemies. The tree that you saw, which grew and became strong, whose height reached to the heavens and which could be seen by all the earth, whose leaves were lovely and its fruit abundant, in which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and in whose branches the birds of the heaven had their home, it is you, O king, who have grown and become strong, for your greatness has grown and reaches to the heavens, and your dominion to the end of the earth. And inasmuch as the king saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave its stump and roots in the ground, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field, let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let him graze with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my lord the king. They shall drive you from men, your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make you eat grass like oxen. They shall wet you with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over you, till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. And inasmuch as they gave the command to leave the stump and roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be assured to you after you come to know that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of the 12 months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. The king spoke, saying, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honour of my majesty? While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you. And they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen, and seven times shall pass over you, until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. That very hour, the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men and ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claws. And at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my understanding returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honoured him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. And his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven. And among the inhabitants of the earth, no one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me and for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor returned to me. My counselors and nobles resorted to me. I was restored to my kingdom and excellent majesty was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven all of whose works are truth and his ways justice. And those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. Amen. Amen. Well, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come into your presence in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a marvelous thing to consider 
that even now we are coming before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You are God. There is no other. And thank you, O oh God, that we can come in the name of Jesus. We remember his words whilst on this earth when he said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man can come to the Father but through me. And so we come in faith now and we thank you, O oh God, that we can come to you just as we are. We thank you that we don't follow a religion where there are demands made in order to achieve a salvation, in order to achieve a rescue, but rather we come to a God who has provided the means of rescue, who has provided the redemption price, who has provided the atoning lamb, who has done it. And so our God and our Father, we don't come trusting in our own merits this morning, far from it. We come running to the Lord Jesus Christ and we look to him who has done it. We look to him who has paid the price willingly in order that he might uh, redeem for himself a people that no man can number. And our God and our Father, we thank you that this glorious invitation to come to Jesus goes out far and wide. Ever since the apostles set out to tell people about this glorious invitation to come to Jesus, many people have heard and many people have responded and have come in repentance and faith. And Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are not on our own. We thank you that even today there will be many churches Many people gathering to meet together to publicly declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. And not just in this nation, but in nations all around the earth. And our God and our Father, we thank you that one day uh, Jesus is coming again. One day he will come, even as we heard last Sunday evening, one day he will come in splendor. And this time not to save, for he has already come to be that means of salvation. But this time he will come to judge the living and the dead. And so, our God and our Father, we pray that it would be impressed upon us, even this morning, the need to get right with you. We pray that it would be impressed upon us this morning by your Holy Spirit that there is a door that is open and we may go in when we come as a sinner to Jesus. Father, we thank you, we praise you for the gospel, the good news of salvation in the person and finished work of Jesus. We thank you that we have this great and abounding hope in him. We thank you, O oh Lord, that now as those who are in Christ this morning, those who have a testimony, those who are able to say, I once was lost, but now have been found. Those who are able to say, I once was king of my own life, but now Jesus is king of my life. Father, thank you that those very people are able to testify of your goodness and your mercies even this past week. Truly, O oh God, your goodness and mercies have been new every day. Great is your faithfulness. And Father, we thank you that as we meet this morning, we are able to rejoice. We're able to rejoice in the fact that we're able to worship the living God. That our hearts are free, free to worship you, O oh God. And we thank and we praise you, O oh Lord, that uh, the, the, the best is yet to come. And we thank and we praise you that even in these days, there are people who are being added to the church. People who are crying out, what must I do to be saved? And then they're turning to Jesus and they are being saved. Oh, Heavenly Father, truly, we have much to give you thanks for. Truly, we have much to rejoice over. And so, our God and our Father, please help us to lift up our hearts, lift up our voices. Please help us to fix our eyes upon Jesus Christ. Because he is indeed the loveliest of 10,000. We would testify this morning that there is nothing that compares with knowing you, O oh God. You are the greatest you are the most wonderful, and we thank you, we praise you, that even now we can come together to worship you. We commit the meetings of this church into your hands this coming week. We remember, O oh Lord, that we are in this society, and we pray for all that is going on. There are, there are wars all around the world. There are uh, difficult situations uh, throughout our society. There are, there's such suffering, there's such sorrow, there are so many problems, there's such despair. You, O oh God, and you alone, are the answer. And so we pray for those who are in authority. We pray, oh God, that you might break into their lives. And we pray for the witness of the church. We pray, oh God, that the church might indeed be bold in these times and might be clearly pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh God, we mourn over the reality that so many people name Jesus. Uh, so many people tell, say that they are Christians and yet, in reality, there's no power in their life. Oh God, our Father, please... 
work afresh in our lives, let alone anybody else's. And Father, thank you now as we come to your word. Uh, we ask, O oh Lord, that you would minister to us through your word. Your word is truth. Sanctify us by your truth. Help us to understand. Help us to listen. Help us to take it in and help us to respond. We thank you that this is a living book. We thank you that it is a powerful book. It's dynamite. And we pray this morning, Lord, as it were, in the right sense, that a bomb would go off in our hearts, that all the resistance, all the pride, all the stubbornness, all the willfulness, all the me, me, me would be completely obliterated and that we would be sat at the feet of Jesus, clothed in the righteousness of him and in our right mind. Oh God, our Father, we thank you for you are, for great is our God and greatly to be praised. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, before we come to uh, the message, let's stand and sing this lovely uh, chorus, Ascribe Greatness. So, um, another way, helpful way to get uh, scripture into us. Now then, uh, chapter four. Uh, I've, I don't know if you can guess the, uh, uh, the, the title of the message. We've had Daniel part one, part two, part three. Now we've got Daniel part four, okay? So, uh, the final part. Uh, this is... Really, chapter 4 is the testimony of Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, it's wonderful, you know, because there are many here this morning who are in Christ, and they too have testimonies. And everybody's testimony is different in so many ways. Circumstances, context, the way God dealt with us and brought us to himself. And yet, the familiar thing with each and everybody's testimony is that God met with us through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we were brought to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, as I understand it, this is Nebuchadnezzar's testimony. And it's, it's a long time coming, isn't it? We've had three chapters. Now, we know Daniel has taken center stage at one point, And then there's been Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And God has been dealing with them and they've been wonderful in their witness and their testimony. They've really been good signposts to Nebuchadnezzar. And certainly at the end of chapter 3, we must have thought now Nebuchadnezzar will bow the knee to God because he's seen with evidence, his own eyes, that fourth person delivering them from the fiery furnace, delivering them in the fiery furnace. And uh, yet we know, don't we, that there still there wasn't grace in his heart, we know because he said from ver in verse 29 of chapter 3, those who don't bow the knee to this God will chop up. <laughs> That's not, those aren't the words of someone who has had met with the living God in an experiential way. Those aren't the words of someone who has a new heart. And so still, he's wriggling on the end of that line. Still, he is resisting God. And maybe there are amongst us this morning some who have had such interactions with God. Some who have come into contact with many who have been really good signposts pointing clearly to the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet, there's still a stubbornness. Well, there's both an encouragement and a warning in this chapter because the reality is that God did finally bring Nebuchadnezzar to himself. But there was a great price to be paid. And also, you cannot guarantee, if you are this morning wriggling, resisting the work of God in your life, you cannot guarantee that God will indeed bring you to himself ultimately. Insomuch as, if today you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Because for every, every Nebuchadnezzar that has fully and finally been brought into his kingdom, God's kingdom, there have been many who have been called, many who have heard the gospel call, but yet, there's, yet many then have ignored it and gone their own way. And God has allowed them, because of his sovereign purposes, he has allowed them to go their own way. So it's both a, a, an encouragement and a warming, warning. Now, the problem. I've got three titles, uh, three points. The problem, the solution, the result. The problem. What's the problem? Nebuchadnezzar is the problem. Somebody once um, uh, said, uh, I need, I, I, this isn't going to be quoted uh, perfectly, 
But in the Times, back in the uh, early 1900s, I think it was, somebody put in, you know, what, what, what are the problems of the world? What is the problem of the world? And uh, somebody wrote in and said, I am. I'm the problem. Inasmuch as Nebuchadnezzar is the problem, what we'll see is almost an immovable object with an unstoppable force. Those physicists amongst us will, will uh, be salivating at this thought. The reality is, in many ways, uh, Nebuchadnezzar is, is an unstoppable force. Who can stop him? He's, he's a leader of the known free world at that time. He's, his power is growing and growing. His influence is growing and growing. His majesty is growing and growing, as we, we understand by the figure of the tree. Growing and reaching the heavens. Inasmuch as there's no one like him amongst men. And he has had so much in, by way of God interacting with him. And yet still, he is ruling his life. Still, he is full of pride. Still, he is rebellious towards God. Still, he, if we were to draw a diagram and there was to be a picture of a throne, it would be him who is sat on that throne. And that's a problem. Because the reality is, God alone is God. And he is a jealous God. He must have his glory. What's the problem with the evil one? The devil. The devil robbed God of his, sought to, sought to rob God of his glory. And sought to usurp God's place. That's why in the scriptures he's called the usurper. He sought to take the place of God. That's what sin does. Sin robs God of his glory. So when we are being sinful and doing sinful things, that's a problem, of course, because how can we come into contact with a holy God? We would be burnt up by the very sin that is in us. Yet, nevertheless, there's also the issue of the fact that we are not giving God his place. We are in open rebellion against God. We are not giving God his place. And there cannot be a relationship with God if we don't give God his place. There cannot be a reconciliation with God if we're still refusing to bow the knee. Now, the Bible tells us quite clearly one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But by that time, it won't be a day of opportunity. It won't be a day of grace. In Nebuchadnezzar's time, it was. It was a day of opportunity. It was a day of grace. In our time, today, it is a day of opportunity, a day of grace. But you don't know how long that day will last for. You don't know when Jesus will come again. You don't know when you will be taken from this earth. But when Jesus does come again, that day of opportunity will end. But everyone will bow the knee. Everyone will confess that God is, uh, Jesus is Lord. Why? Because it's the truth. So there's a problem. And the problem is Nebuchadnezzar. What is God going to do with him? And yet, you know, God's ways are perfect. And so God sends this vision. We're not going to dwell too long because of, of time. But the reality is that uh, maybe he didn't speak to Daniel first off because maybe in his heart... He knew, you know, oftentimes when people are resisting God, they know deep down. And sometimes the people who are the noisiest in their resisting God, the people who will scoff, the people who will laugh, the people who will, who will get angry, sometimes actually it's simply because in their hearts they know it's true and it makes them squirm. Well, uh, Daniel does come eventually after the others have, have realized, you know, have said they, they can't interpret it. And so Daniel does come. And isn't it lovely? You see, Daniel is astonished and he's quiet and he doesn't want to tell the king the dream, the vision, what it means. Why is that? Well, very simply, because Daniel loves Nebuchadnezzar. Very simply, because Daniel has worked for Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel has an affection for Nebuchadnezzar. You know, uh, unbeliever, you know, why are we saying these things to try and bring you to the Lord Jesus Christ? Why are we saying these things? Is it because we're sat on our soapbox? Is it because we're sat and we're pointing a self-righteous finger? No, no, God forbid. It's because we love you. It's because we can't bear the thought of where you will head to if you die outside of Christ, if you die in your sin. We would not wish that on anybody, to have an eternity under the wrath of God. 
You know, sometimes we might have a fright, mightn't we? Sometimes maybe, uh, I don't know, the car in front will stop suddenly and we'll have to really slam the brakes on and we come out in a little bit of a sweat and our heart starts racing. Sometimes maybe we'll fall and slip and we'll get winded and it'll take us a little while to collect ourselves. Sometimes perhaps we might have some bad news and we feel a bit in shock and it might take some days or even weeks to really gather ourselves. You know, the reality is that's just a little glimpse of what it will be like. You know, our lives are very pleasant by and large. There may be, I don't know, there may be some, some people here with great problems, great difficulties, great distresses. Maybe their childhoods haven't been what they should have been. Maybe there's relational problems. I don't know, but the reality is it's as nothing compared to an eternity without God's grace. None of us here have spent a moment without God's common grace upon us. God's common kindness upon us. The sun shines, the food is provided for. Many of us, most of us will have shelter. But the reality is when eternity comes and those who are outside of Christ are condemned justly to an eternity of God's wrath, then there will be no silver lining in the cloud. There will be that just that dread and that reality of, of, the, of the wrath of God upon us. Uh, the Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And conversely, he says that the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So to live as though there is no God is the height of folly. It's the height of foolishness. And Nebuchadnezzar has continued to live as if there is no God. How do we know? Because he's proud. He's looking at what he has done. He's giving the glory to himself. He isn't acknowledging God. He isn't giving God his place. And so Daniel, when he comes to interpret this dream and he's troubled by it, he longs that Nebuchadnezzar might, might heed the warning. Now, he doesn't say here that if you do something, then this warning, this, this dream won't happen. He doesn't say that. Uh, this seems to be, uh, Daniel understands that this must come about. And Daniel understands perhaps that this must come about in order that God would bring him. And sometimes we may see in the lives of people suffering or loss or difficulties. And sometimes we look on and we say, well, maybe God, you're allowing this because it's got to bring this person to yourself. Maybe it's through this very tragedy that that person will be brought to yourself. It doesn't make that tragedy any the less, though. And Daniel here is human. Daniel here recognizes the suffering that this king is going to go through. And he's heartbroken by it. You know, the Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish. God doesn't delight in, in the suffering of people. He hasn't created us to suffer. He's created us to enjoy him. That's why we're created. But through our own choice, we've rebelled against God. And God mourns over that. He sorrows over the reality that suffering abounds. So Daniel, at first, he's stunned. He's stunned because he knows what's going to happen. And uh, it's, it's lovely in terms of there's real love here. And he explains, doesn't he, what's going to happen. Basically, the king is going to lose his mind. Now, the medics give this a term, lycan, lycanthropy or something, where basically someone believes that they're an animal. But even if medics didn't have a term, uh, a term for it, we would still believe it because it's in the scriptures. And this isn't written as some allegory. This is written as historical narrative. So Nebuchadnezzar really did lose his mind. And there's many people who have sought to look at the records of, of, of uh, that time and sought to kind of marry things up. And, and, and there seems to be a time when he was absent from his kingdom. But whether we look at the records or not is immaterial. The Bible says it's here. So it's here. And he loses his mind. He thinks he's a beast. He, he loses. He's dehumanized. And the reality is, you know, friends, sin... Dehumanizes, dehumanizes us. You might think of the person who is um, uh, uh, successful and has everything it seems that this world has to offer. And you might look on them with envy or jealousy. But the Bible says, what should it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? And when Jesus says in John 10, I have come that you may have life and life in abundance. What's he saying there? He's saying that he's come, that we may have now spiritual life. You see, we're not as human as we could be. 
Because man was made to be in fellowship with God. But because of sin, there's a part of man that has died. The spiritual. We are spiritually dead when we're outside of Christ. But when we come to Christ, what is happening? He's bringing us to life, spiritually speaking. We had a heart of stone, but now there's a heart of flesh. And so actually, Christians are the most human on this earth. Because we were meant to worship God. That's the true humanity. So Nebuchadnezzar, there's a dehumanizing, there's a, there's a dealing with. What, what's God doing here? He's humbling him. And this brings us on to the solution. You see, there is a solution that Nebuchadnezzar and God can get on. But God isn't the problem, Nebuchadnezzar is. And the pride of Nebuchadnezzar, the sin of Nebuchadnezzar, it's a huge problem. It's a huge issue. God and Nebuchadnezzar cannot be in a communion with each other. Nebuchadnezzar cannot be reconciled to God until that problem has been dealt with. And this is God's way of dealing with, with it. Now, the different testimonies, and we look in the coming weeks and months to try and uh, have perhaps a, a meeting where we can uh, regularly hear people's testimonies. It's fascinating to hear how God has dealt with individual people. This is how God dealt with Nebuchadnezzar. God may have be dealing with you, you who are yet to come into to Christ, God may be dealing with you in a different manner. But the purpose is the same. The purpose is to get us to that place where we acknowledge who God is and we acknowledge who we are. When someone becomes a Christian, they get to that point where they acknowledge they are the problem, they are the sinner, they need a saviour. And they look and they see that Jesus is the saviour. And so although God deals differently with each of us, there's a bespoke plan that goes on. Yet ultimately, the solution is the same. The solution is what? God has to deal with us to get us to the point where we recognise that we're in need of him. And so here, Nebuchadnezzar is humbled. God is humbling Nebuchadnezzar. Now I say to you, friends, don't wait Maybe there are those amongst us here this morning who think, well, it's okay, I can continue being Lord of my life until such time as God humbles me, and then I will turn. There's three reasons why that you shouldn't do that. One, because you are testing God. God may not humble you. He may leave you to your own devices, and you will go then off, uh, out of this earth, outside of Christ. Two, when God humbles, it hurts. Christians are exhorted themselves. Humble yourself lest you be humbled. The Christian is exhorted in his Christian life, when he's running the race and he's in communion with God, the Christian is exhorted to humble themselves. Don't wait for God to humble you. So all the more, before you become a Christian, don't presume upon God's humbling. Don't wait for it because it will be jolly painful. And number three is why would you spend another day in death? Why would you miss out on eternal life? You see, the reality is when Nebuchadnezzar comes back to his senses and he's now in a relationship with God, as I understand it, and he's now giving God his place, what's happened to Nebuchadnezzar? The splendor and the majesty are restored and increased. And the wonderful thing is, for those who are in Christ, if you seek first the kingdom of Christ and his righteousness, the Bible says all these things will be added to you. What does that mean? In other words, that actually when you put God first, God is no man's debtor. And so why would you miss out on that? Why would you miss out on God's blessing? Why would you miss out on knowing the peace of God? Because you are now at peace with God. Why would you miss out on that? Why would you not live? The, 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 uh, the, the prophet of old said, turn, turn and live. Why would you not turn? Why would you not live? So there are three reasons why you ought not just to think at this point, well, if this is the case, if I'm in such a situation as this, I will just wait for God to humble me. Don't, don't wait, friends. Today is the day of salvation. But God brings a solution. And what, what is the solution? He cuts Nebuchadnezzar down to size. There is Nebuchadnezzar. He's looked around Babylon and he's seen all that he's built. And you know, if we understand the, the, um, uh, the history correctly, I think there was, a, there was a building he built in 15 days. 
That would challenge even some of the skyscrapers being built in the Far East, wouldn't it? You know, there was so many buildings, so many temples that were restored, so many gardens. Remember the gardens, the hanging gardens of Babylon, the palace, all these various buildings. Seemingly, it was a, a, an ancient wonder of the world. He wasn't known as a warrior. He was known as a builder. That was what Nebuchadnezzar was known for. And so he's looking on and he's on. He's, he's walking and he's seeing all of these buildings. And he's thinking to himself, all this I have done. He's not giving God his place. He's not humbling himself before God. He's full of pride. He's full of self. And so what does God do? He does what he's promised to do. And yet what he's doing, we read at the start of the, 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 the service, we read about those who are in chains because they, uh, God has put them there, because they've rebelled against God. And yet being in those chains brings them to a point where they cry out to God. So actually when God is cutting down Nebuchadnezzar now, this is actually God being merciful. So, again, I, I asked someone perhaps whose life is going very well. And someone who thinks, well, my life's going very well, so therefore I don't need God. Well, there's a number of reasons, again, why that's wrong. You don't know what you're missing out on. You think your life is going well now, but the very, the very core of you is rotten. And the very core of you... Is, is missing out on a relationship with God. You don't know what you're missing out on. But also, when your life is going very well, and you're not giving God the glory, and you're not humbling yourself, and you're not coming in repentance and faith to Him, it's actually not a great sign when God just leaves you to it. That isn't a sign of God's mercy. So, God has the solution. He chops Nebuchadnezzar down to size. He gives him this insanity, if you will. He causes him to be broken. He breaks him. And yet he breaks him in order that Nebuchadnezzar might get the order right. In order that Nebuchadnezzar might give God the glory. You know, there's a solution that's been given to us for our sin. The Lord Jesus Christ. And the wonderful thing here is that Jesus Christ was broken. This is my body broken for you. This is my blood shed in remission of sins for you. The wonderful thing is that God gave his own son in order that we might be reconciled. You see, God is never the problem. We are. But God has the solution. And the solution is real. The solution works. You see, what is the result of this? Number three then, the result. The result is that here is this man, this king, who has had lots of interactions with those who are Christians and yet is untouched and is still proud of heart and yet now God deals directly with him and he is broken. But it's a mercy of God to break this man. Why? Because now he gives God his place. Now he understands his own place. Now he understands that God is God. He is not. Nebuchadnezzar isn't. Nebuchadnezzar is but someone who is, who is the creature. God is the creator. Now Nebuchadnezzar understands that he is able, that God is able to put down those who walk in pride. You see, it's, it's been a painful lesson, but look at the response, and this is why we believe that Nebuchadnezzar has come and become a Christian through this. Look at this response. He's grateful to God for what has happened. Think of Zechariah before uh, 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 John the Baptist's dad, and Zechariah was struck with dumbness because he was unbelieving when the angel gave him the message concerning his wife becoming pregnant. And yet, look at, Nebuchadnezzar, look at Zechariah's response when he was then able to speak. He gave God all the glory and all the praise. One of the fruits that God is at work in someone's life is that they don't grumble against God for suffering coming in. That they actually give God the praise, counting it joy that they're able to suffer for God, knowing that God does all things well. You see, Nebuchadnezzar could have thought, how cruel is this? What sort of God does this that basically makes me like an animal? And yet he doesn't. He comes out of it saying, glory to God. God knows what he's doing. 
You see, there are many who say that one day they will get before God and they will give God a telling off. They will give him, put him straight. I've heard many people publicly saying it. And honestly, every time I hear it, there's a cold shiver that runs down my spine. Two reasons. One, because they are wrong. They are misnaming. They are slurring the name of God. God is not wicked. God is good. And God only ever does good things. And we might not understand all the things that God does. But we will say, as with Abraham, shall not the judge of all the earth do right? God is good. But secondly, take the plank out of your own eye, man. We're the problem. And so Nebuchadnezzar comes to this understanding. He understands that he's been the problem. He understands that he was proud. He understands that it was him who was not bending the knee. He understands that his willfulness was getting in the way. He understands that he wasn't giving God his place. But now, as a result of God dealing with him, as a result of God humbling him, now he does. Listen to this testimony. Now I, verse 37, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all of whose works are truth and his ways justice. And those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. What's God done? How is Nebuchadnezzar able to say that? What's the difference between the end of that chapter and the end of the previous chapter? There's now grace. You can tell, can't you? Verse 29 of chapter 3, Therefore I make a decree that any people, nation or language which speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego shall be cut in pieces and their houses shall be made an ash heap because there is no other God who can deliver like this. What's the problem there? Graceless. But this testimony, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honour the King of heaven, all of whose works are truth and his ways justice. And those who walk in pride he is able to put down. What's happened there? Grace. He now has a personal relationship with God. At the end of chapter 3, he was looking on at what God was doing in other people's lives. And maybe there are some here who would stand up and defend their relatives if they got troubled for being a Christian. Maybe there's some here who would vote against other religions coming in and they would, they would say, well, I'm a British, so therefore I, 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 I'm, I, I follow this Bible. And yet it's not personal. There's, there's no grace. But you see, Nebuchadnezzar now, there's grace. The Bible says, it says it in James 4 verse 6, it's quoting a verse in Proverbs, says this, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now with Nebuchadnezzar's life, God had to chop him down in order to break his pride. But once his pride was broken, he lifted him up. He resisted the pride, but the proud, now that his pride is broken, he gives grace to the humble. I do not pray for these alone, but for all for those who will believe in me through their word. That's the prayer of Jesus in John 17, the famous intercessory prayer. The reality is, friends, that our testimonies are of much value. Because of us? No, not particularly. Because of God working in us. And here, Nebuchadnezzar just wants to testify. He just wants to testify, not, look at what buildings I've built. His testimony has changed. His testimony is... Look at who God is. I want to testify, this is God. I want to testify, I know him. I want to testify that I want to give him his place. Now I wonder, it's not enough, friends. There may be some here who know about God. Or in New Testament terms, know about the gospel. Know about Jesus. Know about that there is a way back to God. It may be that there are some here who would even... Go as far as to say that out of everything else, they would, they would, they would say Christianity is the, is the religion. There may even be some who would say, well, I, I follow that. If I'm going to follow anything, I follow that. There may be some who can see in other people's lives God working. And they have no truck with saying this is authentic. This, how can we explain it other than they may not have seen a fourth person in a fiery furnace, but they have certainly seen Jesus Christ at work in other people's lives. But still, that's not enough. What's the issue? 
The issue is, it must be personal. And it's not enough to nod with our head. The issue is, what's going on in our heart? Let me ask you this simple question. Who is king of your heart? Who is king of your heart? And the simple reality is, friends, if it's not Jesus, you've got a problem. But praise God that even Nebuchadnezzar, God is able to save to the uttermost. Even Nebuchadnezzar, God is able to deal with and bring to himself. Don't wait until you're humbled. Don't wait until you're on that operating theatre. Don't wait until you lose a loved one. Don't wait until... Because you're not guaranteed anything. But today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Give God his, the play, his place. Humble yourself. Ask the Lord Jesus Christ into your life, as it were. Come to him, just as you are. Ask him, receive him, even now. The solution, the Lord Jesus Christ, the solution, the ultimate solution, the only true solution. The Lord Jesus Christ dying in our place. The problem, our sin, the solution. Jesus Christ paying for our sin in order that that hindrance can be removed, in order that there can be a bridge between God and man. Only Jesus. Now, whilst it is day, humble yourself. Bow the knee. Turn to the Lord. And the wonderful thing is that in due course, as you do that, you too will have a testimony. And that testimony in due course, just as Nebuchadnezzar's testimony, even now, is being used for God's glory, thousands of years after he spoke it, even now, friends, when you are able to testify in the coming weeks and months that actually the result of God's intervention in my life is that now I am alive. Now I am at peace with God and knowing the peace of God. Now I enjoy this abundant life with Jesus. Even that testimony will be used. Maybe to your school friends, maybe to your work colleagues, maybe to your children, maybe to your neighbours. But this is the glorious thing, friends. God is able. God is able to save you, even now, just as you are. And for those who are thinking, I've missed the boat. For those who are thinking, I've pushed God too far. For those who are thinking, well, how could he possibly save me? Because I'm so out there. I'm so beyond any reach. Don't listen. There's two lies that you need to realise today are lies. The first lie... God can't save me. If that's in your mind, that's not from God this morning. Get rid of it, because God can save you. And secondly, and finally, if you think, ah, oh, I'll leave it. There's time. That's definitely a lie that is there from the evil one. Today, now, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart come to the Lord Jesus Christ in repentance and faith. Come and give God his place. I am a sinner. He is God. King Jesus is the saviour. You've offered to save me. Please, oh God, just as I am, come and save me. And even now then, my testimony will be, I praise and extol and honour the King of heaven, all of whose works are truth and his ways justice and those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. Amen. Let's sing to close uh, a very apposite, uh, pertinent song. Uh, there is a higher throne. Let's stand to sing.